Okay, welcome everyone to the National Care Deconus Foundation webinar series 2020. My name is Dr. Jason Marsak. I'm an associate professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry with a research interest in keratoconus, the optics of the eye of the individual with keratoconus, and correction strategies for uh, dealing with vision problems associated with keratoconus. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Barry Iden. Dr. Iden is president and medical director of North Suburban Vision Consultants, a multidisciplinary specialty group practice. He is president and founder of the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals. He's also a co-founder and president of IVIS Eye and Vision Research Institute. Dr. Iden is an assistant clinical professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago Medical Center, an adjunct faculty member of the University of, uh, of the Indiana, Illinois, Silas, SUNY, Midwestern, and University of Missouri at St. Louis Colleges of Optometry. Dr. Eden is also past chair of the American Optometric Association's Conduct Lens and Cornea Section. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, Dr. Eden is also a respected lecturer both nationally and internationally and frequently publishes in the professional literature. Today he'll be speaking to us regarding keratoconus, early detection, and defining progression. Dr. Eden. Well, thank you, Jason, and it is a true pleasure to be here tonight speaking to uh, the folks who are part of the uh, National Keratoconus Foundation, which is an organization that I've been involved with uh, for many, many years and have the utmost respect. And tonight, we're going to try to share with those folks who are listening in about some of the newer developments in the area of early detection of keratoconus and the early detection of its disease progression, which is really, really important, as we'll see, for a number of reasons. So I just wanted to share with everybody some of my disclosures with some of the organizations that I do some consulting, lecturing, or research with, um, and then we can move forward. I just wanted to begin by sharing with the attendees tonight uh, a little bit of information about our organization, which is the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals. This is an organization that, in essence, is sort of like a sibling to the National Keratoconus Foundation where the National Keratoconus Foundation has its mission to provide the greatest amount of information and assistance to patients who suffer from keratoconus and their families. IKA, or the International Keratoconus Academy, our mission is to be able to share the most current information about keratoconus and other forms of cornea with the eye care profession. So, Dr. Sorry. Iden, this is, um, just really quick, I, you're getting a little bit of feedback on your mic. Is there any, um, are you able to maybe reposition your microphone? Um, how does this sound now, Jason? Yeah, it's yeah. still a pretty significant sorry. feedback. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's just it's hard, hard to start, to start your, mic your microphone. It was working so well before, before, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding you with that. Um, Let's see, let me, um, I'm going to contact the organizer and see if we can resolve that. Why don't you go ahead and continue for the moment? Okay, well, I hope that uh, others, others can hear me a bit better. So I was just, I was just sharing, sharing some information, information about, about our organization, the International, International Keratoconus Academy. 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 Uh, our, our purpose group is comprised of some of the, of the, some of the uh, most well-known well known and most respected respects in the area of keratoconus, both in terms of optometry, knowledge, and the United Eye Care organizations. So, so everybody, everybody who's on this, on this call, call, on this on webinar, webinar this evening, this evening is, is familiar, familiar with these. Many, many, many of you are listening in or are affected, affected personally, personally or, or family members, members, members are, are affected, affected personally, personally as, well. as well. And as we and know, we know the general, general definition, definition of course, is that it's, that it's a condition, condition in which we have a common shape, shape because of causing any intrusion. And what happens, as we, as we all know, all know is that it affects the optics of the visual system, and the source of the visual system, and the tremendous challenges to everyday day performance and function for patients who suffer from this disease. So our so goal, goal is to try to see, see if there's a any way to detect this disease early on, on intervene, and, and hopefully avoid people, people suffering, suffering from, from the severe impacts of this disease. 
will understand and is I care like your professionals take care of their communications, which is very important on a daily basis. And the truth the is, is that we that have interactions with these individuals that will say sincerely last, last minute, minutes each year. Each year. We don't need Dr. Either. Either. This is Jason again. Here, um, we're getting a little bit of uh, input from the online uh, individuals as well as from the organizer. You, you remain a little bit staticky. So right now what we'll do is we're going to pause for a moment while um, the organizers of the National Care Deconus Foundation are going to send over some instructions on how you might connect a slightly different way. Because right now the static is causing it difficult to understand. I am so sorry. sorry. Yep. yep. So please, everyone, just kind of bear with us for one moment while um, we try and reestablish that connection. Um, also, just kind of in this time while we we have a moment while we're reestablishing that, um, I did want to mention that in the in your window, you'll notice that in the uh, attendee window, there is an, a place for you to type questions. Um, if you type questions there, they're being moderated again by an individual at the National Care Deconus Foundation. And those questions will be fed to us, and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation this evening. So please do, as you have questions today, feel free to enter those into the, the uh, question panel in the, the webinar uh, sidebar, and those will be addressed as we, uh, as we make it to the end of the presentation today. So please do bear with us for a moment while um, the individuals at National Care Deconus Foundation um, send some information over to Dr. Iden to try and restock patients. I am... Really sorry, folks, uh, but we got through this, I hope, and uh, so we'll move forward. Again, we as uh, eye care professionals deal with our patients on a daily basis, but our interactions with our patients are limited in terms of time. We see how they function in the exam room. We hear what they tell us as their major uh, complaints and problems, but we really don't understand the true impact that this disease has on their lives. And it's only been through my experiences in listening in to organizations, speaking with folks when I've given talks for the National Keratoconus Foundation, and also honestly checking on some of the social media sites where patients with keratoconus share their thoughts and experiences. So I'm going to share with you what I have seen recently. This was just one patient who posted on one of the sites, uh, social media sites with keratoconus, and the patient said, I'm really trying to have positive thoughts and attitudes as I deal with keratoconus, but some days it's hard. You never really know what you have until it's gone. Every waking moment, we use our eyes, so every waking moment, I'm reminded of this struggle. I want to do all I can to help my vision get better, I and mean, this really tears at your heart. And I think it's really opened up my mind to really understand better the impact that this disease has on patients who suffer from it on a daily basis. So I wanna share with you folks who have keratoconus, number one, that you're not alone. And when I say that, we understand in this community on this phone call or this webinar uh, this evening uh, that we have many people who share the same problems. And by being together, we really gain strength. And I wanna share with you the fact that we may have thought in the past that keratoconus was relatively uncommon, but things are changing. And let me share that with you. Let's talk about how common keratoconus is in the population or what we call the prevalence of keratoconus. Well, there's been classic references over many years that the prevalence of keratoconus would be one case in 2,000 individuals. This statistic, folks, comes from a study that was published way back in 1986, but that study was based on a registration study that took place in Minnesota between the years of 1935 and 1982. And the way that keratoconus was defined or detected was based upon very, very old and now relatively outmoded technology. So if you're using relatively insensitive methods to detect this disease, you're not going to find it as commonly in the population. So let's look more recently. And this is what I have called an eye-opening study, and it was published in one of the most respected journals in eye care in 2017. This particular study was published from a group out of the Netherlands. 
And because they have national health insurance, they have a tremendous database of information. And they were able to look at over 4.4 million patients in this database, looking at medical information and applying much more, shall we say, contemporary diagnostic methods in the ability to diagnose and detect keratoconus. So let's take a look at the prevalence data that came out of this particular study. Amazing, not one in 2000, it was one in 375 individuals. The authors concluded that the prevalence of keratoconus was five to 10 times higher than previously reported. Now, could this be because we're talking about a specific population that may be different than others, meaning people who live in the Netherlands? Possibly, and we know that geographic issues do have an impact on how prevalent the disease is, but more importantly, it was based on the fact that they were applying far more sensitive and more contemporary diagnostic technologies to detect keratoconus. Also in 2017, myself and my associate, Dr. Milana Matz, wrote an article in Contact Lens Spectrum reviewing what studies were out there talking about prevalence in keratoconus and we realize that keratoconus is far more prevalent than we ever thought before. From this thought, the International Keratoconus Academy has undertaken a study that's still ongoing. And what we're looking at is actually the prevalence of keratoconus in a school-aged population. Now, this is what we call a prospective study, meaning we're starting at a certain point and going forward in evaluating individuals. And the population that we're using is based here in Chicago. We have a very active and very busy pediatric eye clinic that works in affiliation with the Illinois College of Optometry, who is our partner in this particular study. And basically, students who are in grades kindergarten through 12, who have failed basic vision screenings in, at their schools are brought to this particular clinic to provide free eye care, comprehensive eye exams. Well, we were able to bring in an advanced technology in detecting keratoconus that we'll get into in just a couple more moments called a Pentacam corneal tomographer. And we started screening routinely these students who went through this clinic by performing this Pentacam diagnostic technology uh, test. And basically, we started with some interim results that we'll report to you now. The study is still ongoing and analysis is still ongoing. This interim report was done after screening over 2,000 children, a very large uh, base of subjects for the study. We incorporated various uh, types of diagnostic uh, criterion based upon this instrument, this Pentacam instrument, and initially, the first step is to flag individuals. Certain parameters of the Pentacam that we predetermined to be relatively abnormal and specific to keratoconus were used as flagging criteria. Out of those first over 2,100 individuals, almost 200 of them were flagged for keratoconus. This is an amazing aspect that gives us a number of approximately one in 20 individuals who were flagged as positive for keratoconus. Now, once this flagging procedure has taken place, and that's where we are right now, then we have a, a group of eye care professionals who are individually analyzing these Pentacam results and will make the final determination of whether or not they feel they are truly clinically keratoconic or not but the interim results are just showing some staggering population numbers. So the whole point is that keratoconus is far more prevalent in our population than ever thought before. And we now as eye care professionals have to figure ways that we can screen for this disease in a pediatric population in an effort to make much earlier diagnoses. And then hopefully if we come up with positive results, then institute therapy that can help these individuals from losing vision as time goes by. 
So this is a particular case or a, a case of two individuals that I wanted to share with you. And I've shared this story in many uh, talks that I've given on keratoconus over the past few years. So a number of years ago, a 59-year-old woman came into our clinic. Uh, she had been diagnosed quite a, a bit of time ago with keratoconus, long-standing. She had a variety of surgical uh, procedures done to help uh, limit her disease, uh, specifically corneal uh, intact ring segments to reduce the severity of the disease as well. And she had been wearing contact lenses and she became relatively intolerant. This particular map that you see is a map from that instrument, the Pentacam I just referred to, and it shows a moderately advanced form of keratoconus. The interesting point was that she was brought in for her examination by her son, who at that time was 28 years old. And since he was sitting there, uh, we were examining his mom, I turned to him and I asked about his vision and when his last eye exam was. Why? Because we do know that keratoconus has a very strong hereditary component to it. So we wanted to get an idea if he had been screened for this disease. And he said to me, Doc, you know what? I've got perfect vision. I haven't had my eyes examined for over five years, but I see perfectly. My friends who I'm hanging out with, if we're driving together, they ask me to read street signs. I see it way before they do. And in fact, he did have excellent uncorrected vision, better than 2020 in each eye. I said, humor me and let me just take a look at your eyes for a few moments. So we looked under the biomicroscope, what we call the slit lamp. Everything was normal. There were no signs of keratoconus. But I said, can I perform or have my assistants perform that test, the Pentacam test, which is very, very sensitive at picking up keratoconus on you, if you don't mind. In fact, we didn't even charge him at that point. We ran a Pentacam screening. And lo and behold, I know you don't know at this particular point how to read these particular maps, but the truth of the matter is this young man had keratoconus. And you can see some of the abnormalities in shape, thickness, and um, curvature uh, of this individual. The point being that within his pupillary zone, which I just highlighted, it is perfectly normal. So that's why his vision was so good. But this individual did have ker keratoconus, what we might term subclinical keratoconus, and he was at high risk based on his age and family history for progressing to clinically significant keratoconus that would eventually have impacted his vision. Fortunately, we intervened with therapy and he's done well ever since. So it becomes very important for us to make early detection a priority in the management of keratoconus. There has been a tremendous paradigm shift, let's say over the last five to 10 years in the management of keratoconus. And the reason is because we can now stop progression of this disease, and with that, we can preserve vision. So early detection has become critically important. And many of you are aware of the uh, therapeutic technology that allows us to control progression, that being corneal cross-linking. Uh, so that has really changed the entire landscape in the management of keratoconus. So if we're able to detect this disease early on and make a definitive diagnosis prior to any significant negative impact on vision and institute a therapy that has a high probability of stopping the progression of the disease, obviously what we're going to do is we're going to preserve vision. And that is the mantra by which I practice each and every day in seeing keratoconus patients. So where does keratoconus all begin? Well, classically, people talk about change in prescription that's greater than expected for age in ways that are atypical for a patient. For example, increases in astigmatism that are atypical for the patient, increases in differences between the two eyes in their prescriptions that is unexpected for that particular patient and their age. Secondly, we look for changes in the appearance of the cornea. Again, I refer to the biomicroscope or slit lamp where we do very detailed examinations of the physical appearance of the cornea and the anterior segment of the eye, and we look for specific findings that are diagnostic of keratoconus. There's also an instrument that we use called a retinoscope, a handheld light, in essence, that shows a certain pattern when we shine it in the eyes of patients with keratoconus. These are all very traditional, very long-standing ways in which we diagnose keratoconus. 
moving more uh, forward time-wise, we start looking at changes in the shape on the front of the cornea. Now, most basically, the use of the keratometer, which has been around for, you know, perhaps over a hundred years at this point or close to it, we will see some development in keratoconus eventually of distortion of the way the, the um, appearance of the results of this keratometer would look. Much more uh, recently, the advent of corneal topography, or what we call placido corneal topography, which measures the curvature on the front of the cornea, then will show us irregularities classic of keratoconus at a much earlier phase than we would find with the keratometer. All of these relate to changes that occur potentially after vision has been negatively impact. So the problem is the kinds of changes I just alluded to may be too late in order to save normal vision because once those things have been affected, vision is likely already been compromised. Now, obviously, if vision is compromised early on, and we intervene, that's far better than letting the disease continue to progress and really severely and significantly impact vision. But wouldn't it be even better if we can intervene and halt progression of this disease while the patient still has what we would consider normal visual function? Here are just some images without going into detail of some of those findings that we see under the biomicroscope, as well as the way some of the images may look when we use that keratometer or retinoscopy. Uh, so again, these are findings that are significant. They are specific very often to keratoconus, but they occur at a later phase where most likely vision has been negatively impacted uh, and patients have lost some degree, if not a significant degree of visual function. So what about changes that occur prior to vision loss? Well, we have now learned that changes occur to the cornea in terms of elevation or height or, and or curvature on the back of the cornea prior to and more advanced than changes that occur on the front of the cornea. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. We also have learned that changes in corneal thickness also occur prior to loss of visual function in keratoconus. Even more sensitive, potentially, corneal structure may be affected very early. The physical strength, or what we call the biomechanical properties of the cornea, may show and do show abnormalities in keratoconus significantly earlier than those changes that result in visual compromise. Taking it even earlier along the spectrum, perhaps now genetic abnormalities or genetic markers for keratoconus that we're learning about may be able to be used clinically before any other changes occur. And there are other things yet to be discovered. So here are just some examples that we'll review in a little greater detail in a few moments about changes that can occur when vision still is normal. And again, if we institute treatment, perhaps we can save vision, preserve vision, and have people lead relatively normal visual lives from that point forward. So let's talk about a very common technology now found in eye care practices called corneal topography. All of you are probably familiar, many of you have had this test done by your doctor in their office. I think statistics today kind of point to the fact that maybe 30 to 40% of eye care professionals in their practices will have access to corneal topography. And what is topography? It's a detailed represent, representation of the surface characteristics of a structure. So when we're talking about the cornea, we're talking about the surface or anterior characteristics of that cornea, specifically measurement of curvature of the front of the cornea. And of course, we can have land topographic maps, but as you can see on the right, we have an example of a corneal topographic map. And when I talk about what we say is placido topography, what we're talking about there are instruments that will basically reflect concentric rings from the instrument onto the front of the cornea. And then the instrument through its computer technology will capture those images, those rings, and analyze them uh, through the computer technology. 
And the analysis is done like this. It basically analyzes the distance between the concentric rings from the center out to the periphery, 360 degrees around. Now, the closer those rings are together, that indicates an area of steeper curvature. The further those rings are apart, that indicates flatter curvature in that particular area. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, placido based corneal topography will provide curvature data. Steeper areas of curvature on the maps will be warmer colors, and flatter areas on the cornea will be reflected as or represented as cooler colors in the maps. So, detecting early keratoconus with curvature based placido topography, some of the things we look for are unusual steepening of the curvature of the cornea significantly greater degrees of corneal astigmatism. A classic one are differences when we compare the top to the bottom of the cornea, whereas in a normal cornea, there's usually good balance between the curvature top to bottom. In keratoconus, there's often great asymmetry between the superior and inferior curvature areas of the cornea. And you can see that here, where the top part in cooler colors is flatter and the bottom part is steeper. Another thing that's really sensitive in picking up keratoconus is what we call a skewed radial axis. And you can see that here below, where a normal corneal astigmatism is separated by 90 degrees, but you can see that kind of distorted element of this steep zone in what we call non-orthogonal astigmatism, and that is very, very common in keratoconus. And then I indicated what I have in italics as indices. That is, most topographers have software programs incorporated into them that kind of look for these findings and analyze them statistically to give you an, a probability of those maps being normal or being keratoconic. So that's how we would try to find early indications of keratoconus utilizing placido topography. Significantly, better than some of the older technologies like looking for changes on the surface of the cornea under the microscope, some of the visual changes that we refer to as well as the keratometer. However, if we start thinking about keratoconus in a slightly different way, and this was done in a paper that was published in 2015, quite a seminal paper in called the Global Consensus on Keratoconus and Ectatic Diseases, this was a paper that came out from a large group of corneal experts throughout the world who sat back and said, let's talk and let's think about what the research tells us about defining keratoconus, defining progression of keratoconus, and defining what we feel the state of the art management of keratoconus should be. There are some weaknesses, of course, in this paper and subsequent uh, groups like this will have to come together as we learn more and more about the disease. But the group basically said that in order to make a mandatory diagnosis of keratoconus and be specific for that diagnosis, there are two of these following three characteristics that have to be met. One is abnormal posterior corneal changes. And I underline the word posterior. That is the back of the cornea. They talk about abnormal corneal thickness distribution, which means not looking just at the thinnest part of the cornea, but looking at how corneal thickness changes from the center out to the periphery of the cornea, being much more abnormally uh, found in keratoconus and more specific to the disease versus looking at the thinnest point in the cornea. And then the third being what we call a clinically non-inflammatory corneal thinning. So if we look back at placido topography, and we consider these very important criterion for being specific for a keratoconus diagnosis, there's a number of things that's missing in placido topography that does not allow us to make the earliest of diagnoses. And what are those? Number one, a placido topography measures the front of the cornea, measures the curvature of the front of the cornea. There's no analysis of the back of the cornea. Number two, the placido topographer does not give us any representation of corneal thickness. There are other issues, but the bottom line here is that when you're doing topography, yes, you will pick up keratoconus for sure, and it's an important technology, but we may be missing a lot, kind of like an iceberg, what we don't see below the surface. So there may be many cases of keratoconus that we might even miss 
even when we incorporate corneal placebo-based topography. So let's move on potentially to even more sensitive technology called corneal tomography. Now a tomogram is a two-dimensional image or a slice or a section through a three-dimensional object. We're all familiar with computer um, tomography or CT scans. And we can now do tomography of the cornea. And there are basically, there's a little bit more than this, but basically three main instruments out on the market today that uh, can do corneal tomography. The most commonly used, the one we use in our particular clinic is called the Pentacam system, but there are others out there as well. Basically, through a very specific form of photography, we get a 360 degree representation of the cornea. And what we can measure with tomography is both the front and the back of the cornea, so critical as we just referred to in the diagnosis of keratoconus. We can get curvature data just like we can uh, on the placido topographer, but this curvature data is uh, generated or uh, found through the true elevation or height data uh, that the tomography does uh, provide for us. And it does give you a global or full corneal thickness representation, or what we call it in the profession pachymetry or global pachymetry. This is an example of an outcome from a pentacam. And without going into great detail, it represents curvature, elevation on the front and back of the cornea, and global thickness of the cornea. So as I alluded to before, the story of keratoconus often will start and will progress greater on the back of the cornea than on the front. So yes, classic keratoconus has anterior or front displacement of the cornea as well as back, but the back part of the cornea always is displaced to a greater degree and occurs earlier in, this, in the disease uh, than does changes on the front of the cornea. So you can actually have cases, which I'll show you in a moment, where there is normal front curvature and elevation but abnormal back elevation and curvature, and that truly is keratoconus, but those patients may have absolutely normal vision. Now, the back of the cornea does contribute to some degree of distortion that's found in keratoconus, but it's very, very minor compared to the, in, the impact of the irregularity on the front of the cornea. Global thickness of the cornea, as we talked about distribution. Now, just looking at the thinnest point in the cornea is not very sensitive for differentiating a normally thin cornea versus a truly keratoconic cornea. But what does differentiate those two is the distribution or the change in thickness as we go from the center out to periphery. In keratoconus, the cornea thickens much more quickly than normalized, even normally thin corneas. So here's an example of what we would call a relatively mild form of keratoconus. And we can see, actually, when we find in the outcome from the pentacam, the corneal thinnest point is statistically normal at 523 microns. And we can represent that here in the absolute thickness graph. The red is this particular patient. Now, those dotted lines show the average in the population and then a spread of normal. And you can see that this patient falls within the normal range for corneal thickness from center out to periphery. But below, it tells you about the change in thickness, or what we call the percentage thickness increase. And we can see here that it will thicken at a greater rate than would be considered normal. You can see how the red line falls outside the normal variability in thickness from center to periphery. So this is much more sensitive at picking up keratoconic disease. The next slide shows a much more advanced case of keratoconus where the absolute thickness at the thin point is abnormal. It's outside the normal range, but you can see how dramatically different that progression uh, of thickness from center to periphery is. So this is a very sensitive way at picking up keratoconus even very early on in the disease. So there are numerous changes to the uh, cornea um, posteriorly and corneal thickness that occur prior to changes that can impact vision. So let's look at what can happen. So let's say we have an abnormal back shape of the cornea, but a normal front shape. Patient probably is going to have normal vision for the most part. But if you do placido topography that only measures the front, you're going to get a normal result on the placido topographer. So that would be called a false negative that the placido topographer says everything's good, 
but actually the patient does have keratoconus. Another example would be a normal back shape, but a, an abnormal front shape. Can that happen? Yes, it can. Trauma can induce that. Um, poorly fit contact lenses can induce that. Uh, a number of things can induce a situation where the shape of the back of the cornea is normal, but the front is abnormal. These are not keratoconic corneas, but if you run a placido topography, you may see a pattern that looks keratoconic, and it would say, oh, you probably have a keratoconus here when you don't, so that would be a false positive result. And then, of course, we have abnormal corneal thickness distribution, which you cannot measure utilizing the placido topographer. And so a placido topographer could be normal, but you have abnormal corneal thickness changes, and you would miss that. Again, a false negative on placido. So these are just some examples here. Shows normal front curvature and normal front elevation of the cornea, but abnormal, you can see that hot spot there, abnormal back surface elevation, truly keratoconus, but this patient would have a normal placido topography and probably would have relatively normal vision. Here in this zone, you're seeing actually what is very suspicious curvature, inferior steepening, but thickness is normal and elevation on front and back of the cornea is normal. So we've reviewed these, and these are just some cases where there can be a discrepancy between the tomography and placido topography, where the tomography is much more specific and sensitive at picking up uh, keratoconus than would be the placido topographer. There are actually software programs that have been developed for tomography that specifically look for ectasia and or keratoconus, and they allow us to help differentiate in some of the more borderline cases. This is critically important for patients who are thinking about refractive surgery, because one of the things we don't want to do is do refractive surgery for nearsightedness and or regular astigmatism on a patient that may be suffering from potentially subclinical keratoconus. The outcomes are very unpredictable and often not desirable for sure. And the sensitivity of those software programs has been shown to be very high as well as the specificity. Sensitivity means our ability to pick up a disease and not miss it. And the specificity is the ability of the test to be specific to that disease and not confuse it with other uh, entities. So we talked about corneal tomography. Let's move on to some potential other technologies out there that also may pick up keratoconus very early in the disease. We have a technology called anterior segment optical coherence tomography, or OCT, where this image that we get from this instrument of the cornea is amazingly detailed and exquisite. This technology predominantly in eye care is used for retinal disease and glaucoma detection, uh, and management, but we are now looking at its application for the front surface of the eye specifically to look at the thickness of the surface cells or the epithelial cells of the cornea. And in keratoconus, what we find when we are able to just measure those surface or epithelial cells in keratoconus, we find out that although the average thickness across the entire surface is not much different than normal, the actual pattern or distribution is different than normal, meaning that there's greater variability in thickness across that surface, even though the average thickness may be relatively normal. And what we tend to get as the, as the condition moves forward is a localized thinning represented here of the surface cells or the epithelium with a surround of thickening. So it kind of gives you almost a donut pattern of epithelial variability in thickness. So this is a case of ours where Regular tomography shows it to be relatively abnormal and keratoconic. When we apply some of that software, we see all these statistical analyses down here being red. That means it's abnormal. So obviously this eye was found to be abnormal. If we run epithelial thickness, which is on the right, on the left here is just global or overall thickness of the cornea, we can see that localized thinning and thickening around the periphery. This is no surprise. This patient has clinically significant keratoconus and we expected that. But we thought for years he only had keratoconus in one eye. Well, if we look at the other eye, his tomography is relatively normal. The statistical analysis does not show that this patient in the other eye has any evidence of keratoconus. However, when we ran epithelial thickness, we got an unusual finding. 
significantly greater variability in epithelial thickness across the surface, where you see this thickening here, relatively thinning here, and here we're looking at what we call the variability along the surface, or the min-max, the thickest versus thinnest point. It's 13 microns. We find that generally anything uh, 10 and above starts to make us uh, a little bit more suspicious of keratoconus. So now we're saying maybe he has subclinical keratoconus that wasn't even picked up by tomography. It wouldn't have been picked up by placido topography either. So that's epithelial corneal thickness measurements using anterior segment OCT. Let's get even more sophisticated. These instruments I'm going to show you now are not really available at almost any eye care professional's uh, offices yet, but they probably will be in the future. We've been working with it for a couple of years now. Going back to the anterior segment OCT, we should notice uh, or note that it is far more common in eye care practices because of its applications to retina and glaucoma that perhaps even over 50% of offices today have access to OCT technology. So its ability, its ability to be applied for keratoconus is really exciting since the instrument's already sitting in so many practices. What these instruments do now are measuring the actual biomechanical properties of the cornea. I alluded to that earlier uh, in the evening. And take a look here and you'll see the reflection uh, images here what happens with this instrument? A puff of air blows at the cornea and it distorts the cornea. And the instrument actually measures the deformation and reformation in response to that puff of air. And what you're seeing here are two virtually equally thin corneas, one being clinically keratoconic and that the other being a normally thin cornea. And you could see how the keratoconic cornea deforms much greater and actually the reformation pattern is quite different. Now, one can't eyeball it usually like this shows you. So what the manufacturers of these instruments have done is start to develop statistical analyses of some of these quantified data of biomechanical properties and come up with an index showing normal versus abnormal versus borderline. So this is all stuff coming down the pike for the future for even earlier diagnosis. And you're able to now actually combine some of the data from tomography along with these biomechanical measurements for amazingly sensitive uh, early diagnosis. And in what we now call the Tomographic Biomechanical Index or the TBI, utilizing this software. Now here in the United States, the software is still waiting for FDA approval, but studies uh, have been taken place and uh, this technology actually is utilized overseas uh, in a very exciting and new way. Again, another level of sensitivity. Take a look at an example here where we see the corneal shape is normal, the tomography comes out normal, but when we add that to the biomechanical index being abnormal, the total or the TBI comes abnormal. So here's a particular case where maybe even tomography isn't showing us everything and perhaps we'll find that corneal biomechanical properties will be even more sensitive at picking up early keratoconus. Taking it to the next level, we talked about that before, uh, and that is genetic testing for keratoconus. So starting this year, there's a company that's coming out with an in-office screening test genetically for, for a number of markers for keratoconus. So be on the lookout for that being a really exciting thing to do for some family members of patients that we already know are clinically keratoconic. Let's spend the last few minutes talking about detection of progression. Again, progression detection is critical because we can do something to stop progression, that being corneal cross-linking. So there are numbers of issues in the detection of progression. How do we define progression? What are problems with some of the current parameters? And we'll go very quickly through these. And what are some of the new things that are coming out in that area? Now, what we have to be sure about is utilizing instrument to instrument, comparing different types of instruments, even though they think they're measuring the same thing, can be problematic. And some of these instruments that are detecting progression, we have to be careful about noise in the system. How much change is real and indication of progression, or how much is just variability or what we would call noise in the system? There's influences also of contact lenses potentially and tear film on the cornea as well. Numerous things we can look to measure to detect progression. Currently, for example, as the corneal cross-linking that has been FDA approved 
uh, called the Avitro system, they utilize a number of measurements that are quite um, basic. Nobody would argue specifically that these would not indicate progression, but I think that we can be even much more sensitive at picking up progression at earlier stages if we apply some of the newer technologies in detection of progression. So there are issues if you use visual changes and visual acuity or, or determining a prescription or refraction. They fluctuate far too much in keratoconus to make them really uh, dependable measurements for us. Looking at physical changes on the surface of the eye, just not sensitive enough to use those to determine early progression. Even the use of front curvature through topography or keratometry can suffer from limitations as well. <clears throat> they fail to look at changes that occur on the back of the cornea, which very often will occur prior to changes uh, on the front of the cornea, as well as changes to corneal thickness. So it's very important that we utilize better technologies or more sensitive technologies, things like tomography as well. Um, we've started to apply these to a variety of software methodologies within some of the tomography instruments. Here is just an example. I know it looks very complicated to you, and it is, but it gives us statistical analyses for tomographic uh, changes in the cornea that would indicate progression, even in cases where patients' vision hasn't changed. And that allows us to intervene earlier with more uh, success. So here are some of the take-home points on progression. It's critically important in light of our ability to control progression to detect it. Currently, there's not a uniform agreement on standardization and validation of methods for detecting um, progression of this disease, but we're moving closer to that. So we need to look at parameters that change early in the disease, hopefully prior to progressive vision loss. And as I mentioned, we're getting much closer to meeting those requirements. So in summary, what should we take home from tonight's talk? Number one, you're not alone. Keratoconus is far more common than we ever thought before. We know that keratoconus can dramatically impact quality of life. And I think it's really important for eye care professionals who deal with patients with keratoconus to significantly become more sensitive about how serious this disease is and how significantly it can affect patients' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Early detection of keratoconus and detection of its progression are critically important in light of our ability to control progression through the application of corneal crosslinking. We now are developing technologies that are allowing us to detect keratoconus at a much earlier point in time before potentially vision is negatively impacted. So early detection of progression is also important in established keratoconus cases as well. And finally, and I highlighted this, you as patients who suffer from keratoconus deserve the best care that we can provide. And it's so important that you make sure that you're getting that best care. For that, I want to thank you for your attention. I also want to specifically thank the National Keratoconus Foundation for asking me to speak tonight. And I want to thank my fellow uh, members of the International Keratoconus Academy of Eye Care Professionals for their ongoing support in our mission to keep moving forward in our ability to help patients live better lives and deal with keratoconus on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, I thank you, and I'm going to now defer to Jason, who may have some questions that the audience may have posed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hyden, for the presentation. Um, a couple of um, questions came in while you were uh, giving your, your lecture. Uh, you touched on a couple of them, but just to make sure the individuals who asked them receive the answer, uh, since they did take the time to ask, um, can you talk a little bit about our current understanding on the etiology of keratoconus, what are its causes, just very yeah. briefly, because you did touch on that during your talk? Yeah, so without diving too deep into the weeds, because it's so easy to do so, let's simplify what I think most of us would agree today that keratoconus is a form of disease that is epigenic. And what I mean by that is there are obvious 
important genetic components to keratoconus. And I don't believe anybody will develop keratoconus who didn't have a genetic predisposition to the disease. That being said, things in the environment can negatively impact the progression of keratoconus and make it worse. Things like mechanical trauma to the cornea, like eye rubbing. So there's a lot of confusion out there, at least from my point of view, in some people saying that eye rubbing causes keratoconus. I don't believe that. And I think the general consensus is that it doesn't cause keratoconus, but things like that surely can exacerbate it. Thank you. Um, another one, um, you know, I've heard varying things, uh, varying aspects, varying opinions on this topic. Um, but if, you know, if an individual were diagnosed with keratoconus in one eye, what is your opinion in terms, or what have you read in the literature to support the likelihood of the, the individual developing keratoconus in the other eye? It's a great question. Um, I truly believe, and I think, again, the majority of, of specialists within keratoconus believe that keratoconus is always a bilateral disease in all cases. The difference is how it expresses itself. And as our technologies become more and more sensitive to picking up keratoconus, we realize in cases where we think it's in only in one eye, we realize the other eye is actually not normal. So if we were only doing placido topography, there are many cases that might look normal in one eye and abnormal in the other. But if we apply top tomography, a lot of those cases show abnormalities of corneal thickness distribution and or abnormalities of the posterior cornea. Then you take it to the next level, as I showed you, if you apply things like epithelial thickness measurements or corneal biomechanics, uh, I believe that there's abnormal aspects to those corneal tissues, even what, in what appears to be normal. Now, that doesn't mean the second eye that appears to be normal is going to go on and become clinically keratoconic. It may never. It may just stay at that level and never present a problem to the patient. But I truly believe that it is a bilateral disease. Along that line, um, once you've determined an individual is uh, kind of dealing with this in their daily life, what is, do you have like a strategy or a kind of algorithm that you go by to, kind of in terms of prescribing them relief from these refractive problems that accompany the disease? Yes, that's a, another great question. These are wonderful questions, actually. So let's say a patient comes to see me for the first time whether they're referred in as a keratoconus suspect, which many patients are referred to to see us uh, with that tentative diagnosis, or we just detect it through our screening procedures, and we've now made the determination that the patient does have keratoconus. The first thing we do is try to determine if we feel the patient is at high risk for progression. That's critical because we wanna know, do we want to apply corneal cross-linking? So should every patient who has keratoconus have cross-linking? Of course not, because many patients may have disease that is highly unlikely to progress. For example, the number one determining factor for that is age. So if I have a patient who we diagnose keratoconus or we note keratoconus in our examination, and one patient is 20 years old and the other patient is 65 years old, the 20-year-old by definition, is at a much higher risk to progress in the disease, and the 65-year-old patient with the same degree of keratoconus is much less likely to progress. So that's the first step in that algorithm of determining what we do. Should this patient have cross-linking or not? Uh, and that is something that we will take very, very seriously and intervene. Then we get into the ability to uh, improve vision. So if keratoconus has in fact impacted vision significantly, we have to determine what's the best method to correct their vision. Mild cases, glasses do work. They work for a lot of people. So keratoconus doesn't always equal contact lenses. Well, as the degree of irregularity and distortion induced by keratoconus increases, then we need to address that typically with contact lenses. And now today, there's a whole host of different contact lens technologies that we can apply to help patients see better, from traditional corneal gas permeables to the now ever more present scleral uh, gas permeable lenses to hybrid lenses, and even many soft lens designs, which really do a very good job 
at correcting vision and reducing some of the aberrations or distortions from keratoconus. So having access to a, a wide array of these methodologies are important. And then, of course, we have to start thinking about interventional methods to improve vision. Things like what is the role or what might be the role of corneal ring segments like Intex? Are there certain cases where it might be indicated, other cases where it may not? And that's part of the decision making. Moving forward, and not yet FDA approved in the United States, is the application of eczema laser technology to reshape the cornea and reduce distortion as well. And moving cross-linking forward, more targeted cross-linking is being looked at for not only stopping progression, but potentially having some positive effect on the quality of vision. And then, of course, we have lots of combination techniques. So surgical, medical, contact lenses, all of that go into play. And we have to approach our keratoconus patients on a global basis like that with a very, very well-informed and broad approach to the management of the disease. We're getting a, a series of questions related to cross-linking. Probably the number is such that uh, maybe the right question to ask is, do you have a um, peer-reviewed or reputable reference or location or some kind of in, uh, site where individuals who want to learn more about this procedure could actually find um, reliable information on that topic? Sure. So probably the best bet for everybody, and I assume our talk is predominantly within the United States, and we know that currently within the U.S. there's only one type of cross-linking that has gone through the rigorous uh, FDA clinical evaluations and approval, and that is the epithelium off procedure um, through Avidro. So going to Avidro's uh, website is probably a great place because there are significant amount of references to clinical studies and outcomes uh, for corneal cross-linking. Um, so that is probably the number one starting point that I would tell folks to go to. There's a tremendous amount of, of information at, the, at that site. You had mentioned earlier about, um, you know, you maybe counsel some of your clinical peers to um, consider some of the real challenges the individuals face, that the individuals that are dealing with this disease are, are maybe dealing with challenges that in some senses might be in, invisible in the clinic. If say we're talking about something like a higher order aberration profile or maybe some of the consequences uh, in the means of daily life. So um, do you have any recommendations for how individuals with keratoconus might best advocate for themselves in the clinical environment, how they may uh, maybe in a sense interact with their doctors to get the best possible care for themselves? Yeah, I think so many of us in the eye care field depend upon the, you know, the tried and true visual acuity test. That's where patients look at the eye chart and read letters, which really only tells you a small portion of the experience visually that patients uh, suffer from in keratoconus. Uh, only a small minority of us have the ability to quantify some of these distortions through a technology we call aberrometry. And that is very powerful, but unfortunately not available in most eye care practices. So it becomes almost incumbent upon the patient to share with the doctor the effect that this disease has on their daily life. Tell them the things that you really struggle with visually, the types of activities, the, the environments that present the greatest uh, challenge to you. Because doctors have to think far beyond just how far down on that eye chart you can read. Because you may be able to read those letters, but they're all distorted. They may be doubled, yet you're still reading it. And the doctor says, oh, you're doing great because your visual acuity is 20 over whatever it may be, but it doesn't tell the story. So tell them how it affects you on a daily basis, both visually and even physically. We all know that keratoconus also is very commonly associated with physical maladies. Things like dry eye are very, very common or allergy symptoms of the eyes and burning and itching. Please share that with your doctors. They can't help you unless you share what issues you're facing. Yeah, one of the things we note in our work is um... You know, it's, it's very difficult to, in a clinical sense, quantify a patient's perception, meaning 
you know, we reading a letter chart is a quantity of vision. How far down can you read? But it doesn't necessarily speak to the quality, like you were just mentioning. Doubling of vision, things like at, a, at night when the pupil gets bigger, uh, performance is maybe poorer than it is during the day when the pupil is small. So um, I do think that um, I agree with you, and I, I appreciate what you're saying, that when, when patients communicate that, it's, it's more information. I, I kind of look at it as, hey, here's more Here's more data points for me to operate on when I'm when I'm thinking of, when I say operate I mean work with when thinking about how this particular individual is uh, kind of dealing with their their environment or how this disease affects them. So That's absolutely true, Jace. Absolutely true. Um, maybe my last question is: um, Do you have any sense of um, certainly National Keratoconus Foundation is a great way for individuals with keratoconus to kind of build a community. Um, but one of the things I noticed was a lot of times uh, individuals with keratoconus, you know, they appear to maybe even have to not maybe be affected by a vision problem because they wear contact lenses. So an, a casual observer may not even know kind of the things that they're dealing with in their daily life. Do you have any, um, you know, sense of how one with keratoconus might build a community for themselves and maybe get support for their condition? Well, as you said, NKCF, the National Keratoconus Foundation, I guess we're, we are preaching to the choir because everybody's on the, call, on the uh, webinar tonight, but that is by far the, the greatest resource, and I just think they've done an amazing job. But, you know, social media has changed the world, right, in so many ways. And there are already numerous communities online, Facebook groups, for people who suffer from keratoconus. Now, keep in mind, those of you who haven't gone there yet, maybe those of you who already have, that it's an unfiltered environment. So people can all kind of say almost what they want to say. There are some people who are overseeing them. But the one uh, caveat for those of you who start going on those particular sites and participating, which I don't think is a bad idea, I think it's nice to feel like you're part of a community, um, a lot of times patients will try to, in essence, prescribe for some of the other folks on there and say, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Well, the best resource always is your doctor. And if you don't have the confidence uh, in the uh, ability of your doctor to take proper care of you, you should be looking for another doctor. Uh, I really have problems with one patient suggesting to another without knowing their particular case what might be the best thing for them. Oh, you should wear this contact lens or you should have this procedure done. Be careful about that. But those communities are in fact helpful. One of the ideas we've been talking to the National Keratoconus Foundation via uh, the International Keratoconus Academy might be, and we hope someday soon to do this, is to have a joint meeting where we might exchange our members, where patients who suffer from keratoconus would come in and work with some of the doctors from IKA and talking and sharing their, their, their experiences in life. And then the doctors going into the group of patients and explaining to them what their journey has been like to try to help patients with keratoconus. So I think a joint uh, experience like that might be something very, very uh, beneficial. So we'll keep trying to work to have that uh, come to fruition. Yeah, that sounds positive. Um, one thing that National Keratoconus Foundation did, we did a, one of these events here, and I know they've done a couple in other areas of the, the country, is a, 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 almost like a keratoconus day. So we actually um, had an invitation here at the University of Houston College of Optometry where we invited individuals in the community with keratoconus to come. And it wasn't uh, a lecture as much about um, kind of some of the very uh, detail-oriented information about the disease as much as it was about trying to just allow individuals with the condition to meet other individuals with the condition as well. And I think a lot of the individuals um, uh, found some comfort in that, just knowing that, again, they weren't the only ones affected. Because a lot of times I think it can be a relatively isolating feeling. Um, so, Along that lines, uh, uh, there's going to be a keratoconus symposium in Ohio at the Ohio State University on May 30th. So that might be something for those of you that are in that part of the country to, to perhaps look at the website and, and see if that's something that you might be a part of, if that's interesting to you. Great idea. So, um, Dr. Iden, maybe any last words as we kind of part here today? Um, thank you again for your lecture. Anything you'd like to leave the crowd with? Yeah, I would just say thank you to everybody for tuning in and uh, 
honestly, the future is very, very rosy, so to speak. Uh, I think tremendous amount of research and effort is going in, and I think uh, there's a lot uh, to be optimistic about in this area. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, from my perspective as a basic scientist, I think um, both clinically and in the in the research realm in terms of basic science, um, there's a lot of individual laboratories and groups and even industry is working very hard on a lot of these problems. So um, I would agree with that. But there's a lot of momentum and energy and uh, real effort being placed into trying to alleviate some of these uh, these concerns. So I would agree. So. Well, Dr. Aiden, thank you very much for your presentation today. I think um, everybody here probably walks away learning, having learned quite a bit. So thank you very much. Um, for our participants, um, I would like to note that April 14th will be our next webinar. Um, details on that will be sent out through the listserv in the in the weeks uh, and soon in the weeks to come. So thank you very much again for being with us, and we look forward to your present uh, per, your uh, participation in a future webinar. Thank you very much. Good night.